Too High Make Fly presents. <laughs> the fear of fear. That's right. Load up on silver bullets and grab your crucifix, because it's another chilling episode of Terrorphobia, a segment dedicated to horror movies, right here on the Two High McFly podcast channel. My name is Kevin Lyons. I am Jose Ramos. And today we're getting super scary, because we're reviewing Brightburn, the new horror movie with a superhero element, directed by David Yaroveski, written by Mark Gunn and Brian Gunn, and also produced by James Gunn, the director of the Guardians of the Galaxy movies. Now this is kind of crazy when they dropped this trailer because it was at a weird time especially for james gunn he had just gotten fired from marvel from tweets he made years ago that he've already been publicly apologized for and they of course the internet mob went crazy Mm -hmm. and some time went by and then everybody's like who's going to pick up james gunn because he's not directing guardians of the galaxy 3 anymore DC comes in, <laughs> swoops up James Gunn, and, and he's going to be doing Suicide Squad. And right when that news came out, the trailer for this came out, and it was such uh, such a ripoff from Superman. It was kind of like, holy shit, they just hired him, and he just released this movie basically just ripping off the whole Superman story. Yeah, and, uh, and specifically Man of Steel, yes. which was what technically started the DCEU. Uh, but yeah, that was interesting. It was like that that middle ground area, and we kept asking ourselves, like, how is he getting away with this? How are they not complaining about this? But I, I'm guessing he let them know uh, during the hiring process, like, I got this project coming <laughs> that I'm producing. <laughs> I mean, pretty much. And like you said, it wasn't just uh, copying the Superman story, specifically Man of Steel by mm-hmm. Zack Snyder. I mean, even the trailers were shot for shot even the same text for the titles and everything like it was just so crazy and it, it was cool so it reminded me of you know something they do in comics uh so marvel does it in their comics they have the what if comics mm-hmm. uh and dc has their elseworld um because they did a similar thing with superman called the red sun yeah where it was what if he landed in russia yeah so this is a cool thing because it fits with what the comics do where it's just like a little side story Except it's not DC doing it, it's someone else. Yeah, I, I've always enjoyed that. I mean, once I discovered that in comic books, how you can take one character and you can do so many different types of stories from them in different lines of continuity, it's always a, very interesting. And that's why I'm okay when seeing new types, like when I see a new superhero movie get rebooted. But what makes this different, they just didn't do a bad version of Superman. They they, they were bringing a horror element into mm-hmm. it. They made, them, they made it fucking scary. And that's what kind of got us all interested and i I think uh interesting thing about it is they had to use his name they had to put his name on the forefront uh to to help sell this Mm -hmm. because if you look at the the director the two biggest things uh i had i saw that he had done was a guardian short and journey to with the rock like the journey to center of the earth that was his two biggest things uh the two writers brian and mark gunn together Remember that TV show? What? No, what show? Oh, MTV show? Yeah. We're together. I, I remember. remember that. I, yeah, they wrote that. That was like their <laughs> biggest writing credits, and here they are writing this. Chris Farley's brother was in that. He played yes. the older brother. <laughs> yes. But that was their biggest writing credits that I saw from the stuff. So you needed James Gunn. James Gunn's name behind this. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, obviously, I mean, yeah, especially if his brothers are writing it. Hey, big bro, can you help <laughs> yeah. us out? You know. So, so I think even with him uh, going and signing up with DC and coming for Marvel, they they still had to put him in the forefront, even if it was a risk. Of course, I mean, I, I don't see any 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 problem with that. It's just like how. I, I just can't believe this was an, a Warner Brothers movie, <laughs> you know, just a, how similar it was. I mean, they didn't just like make reference to the types of it wasn't similar. It was the exact same story of Superman. It's uh, an alien kid crashing into a farm and being raised by the parents. And, you know, he has this whole destiny in front of him. It's it's so crazy. And we just can't believe that they made it. And we're, of course, excited when it was coming out. And we had a chance to see it this weekend. So before we get into the plot, just overall, what did you think of Brightburn? 
Uh, overall, I, I I enjoyed it, and I'll give my rating at the end. But overall, I was I was happy with it. It met my expectations. Okay. Yeah, I was I wasn't exactly excited to see it. I I mean, I thought it looked cool, but I just couldn't believe how much of it was like Superman that I I was just like, I don't know if I even want to see it at first. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I saw it and I thought it was okay. I felt that it was the Cliff Notes version of what that concept was. I didn't feel like it went very deep um, into the characters as much as I would like to, especially when you're taking it from the concept of Superman. You know, you'd figure, what else could we have to bring something else to the table because that's that hard work has already been done laying out that story. What else can we do and make it deeper? And I don't know. I just felt like that's what this movie lacked for me. But yeah, we'll give ratings at the end. So let's just get into the plot. Obviously, the Superman plot, but except for it just takes place in Smallville, but in this case, Brightburn. What, what state was it? Uh, it was it was in Kansas. Was it Kansas? Yeah, was Brightburn, Kansas. Brightburn, Kansas. Right? Is that an actual town in Kansas? I don't I, know. I, I, don't, I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt it. But yeah, yeah the basic plot of it is a um, couple... It's similar to a couple want to have a baby, haven't able to have a baby. You, a couple you, on a farm. On a farm, you even see their their book on like how to have a baby, <laughs> and that's in that scene. It scrolls right by the book to make sure you see it. Like, oh, oh. they're starting to have a baby. Um, which I'm glad they did that instead of the exposition uh, again of oh, we still been trying and we can't have a baby. But uh, yeah, alien baby lands. They raise it as a human. Powers start developing. Except unlike Superman, uh, this baby has more of a bloodlust. What if his human side never dominated enough? What if his alien side dominated more? And mm. that's basically what the plot of this is. Okay. I can see th- I can see that. I had a different aspect of it, and this just goes to show why the Kents were really good parents. Because... <laughs> Because they they were able to help guide him throughout discovering his abilities. And what I got away from this movie was that Elizabeth Banks and David Denman were awful fucking parents. (laughs) They couldn't stop this kid from being evil. I mean, that's I think that's why I some of the problems I had with it was that the kid was just automatically evil instead of just uh, letting that power just get to his head. And there was no, like, real parenting intervention. So, I mean, there was a little bit here and there. there. There were definitely cool moments that involved that. But just overall, I just felt like I didn't like the kid right off the bat. He was just kind of like a bratty bastard. And and there, there's they didn't really get us on his side at first. Say, so, uh, regarding the family dynamic, that I, I disagree with you uh, a little bit on that. Um, I liked what they did with the family dynamic. So... You have mom, uh, a, played by Elizabeth, and her character was so in love with being a mom mm-hmm. in there that she was blinded to all the signs and all the, the signals. And we, you know, and that makes you a shitty parent. Yeah. Man. <laughs> no, well, I, I'm saying her. Yeah, okay, she was yeah. blinded in yeah. that aspect. But I feel uh, dad, he saw, he was seeing the signs. And he was he was like the the one in Richard, but like, don't you see something wrong with this? And she kept fighting him the whole step of the way. But he was the one who kept actually catching things and being like, okay, something's wrong. Yeah, this isn't right. Something's wrong with him. But she was blinded by her motherhood, her love of her child. That's what I just find so crazy because obviously this kid's from another planet. You found it. You found him as a baby in a spaceship. You should be expecting weird shit like this. You know what I mean? It just for the fact that it happens so later on in the kid's development that they're just like, no, there's no way he could be doing anything crazy. You know, but like yet again, you find the kid in your backyard in a spaceship. <laughs> That's a, I don't know, man. Which, which he did though, because. Uh, with the chicken part and all of that, he yeah. was like, it was him. Yeah, like, I know yeah. it was fucking him. Uh, but she was the one. And, you know, we see these incidents in real life. You know, those parents who their kid does no wrong, no matter what. They're just very, they're in denial. They're blinded by it. And that's who she was, no matter what. He was more realistic in what the situation was. And he even reminded her, he's like, this is not our kid. Like, yeah. He's a fucking alien. I felt like that should have been an actual good discussion. That would have been time to be a good parent and and sit the kid down and be like, hey, listen, we found you in the field back there in a spaceship. There's going to be some weird things happening to you that, we, that you can't 
explain and that and like that's that's i felt like that was the approach they should have i mean but if they did that then it wouldn't be the movie that it was Mm -hmm. like him going evil it's just like i don't know i mean still still might have uh they they seem to hint at a brainwashing aspect of it from from the ship like a programming yeah uh from it so it still might have happened uh, even if they try to have that conversation, judging by his sex talk with him, I'm not sure how well it would have gone. Because yeah. that I would say, he was not very good at the talk aspect of it. When when he didn't know what else to say, he was just like, uh, yeah, good talk. That went well. And then just, just like ignore the whole thing. I can understand the awkward concept of that, but I mean, it shouldn't be that difficult to talk to your kids about that shit. I mean, <laughs> you know, I don't know. It shouldn't be, but you'd be, I mean, you'd be, su- you'd be surprised. Yeah. Simpler things sometimes privates have trouble talking with their kids about. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, speaking of, of, of Brandon, um, you are right that they moved into it pretty quick. Yeah. Into, into him going through it, which. I like and I'm iffy about it at the same time. I like that they kind of got into it. They kept it simple. They were like, you know, you know the mythos. Let's just go right into it. The ship is influencing him in a certain way. Who knows if he's interpreting it the right way or not? Yeah. But then the part that's iffy about it is, I would like to see that transition a little bit more. Mm-hmm. But then you want to you run a risk with that, and that's the thing. This movie played it safe in that aspect of it. It was like, we'll keep it simple, and boom do this they could have tried to transition that a little bit more but then you run the risk of you do too much or you don't do it right Mm -hmm. and then it hinders the film so i think that for me that's what kept it from being a really good film but that's also what kept it from being a really bad film they played it safe and it came out in the middle mediocre you know what what movie kind of did that pretty good? Do you remember Chronicle, directed by Josh yes. Kutrank and Max, uh, written by Max Landis? I thought they did that. I mean, because that's almost like this. I mean, it's, it's kids getting superpowers and then going evil with it. But at the, when he first got it, you were kind of you were feeling for this kid. You know what I mean? And he he was getting the powers with his buddies, and then over time, it made him. It just made him. He just snapped and went nuts. And that's what I was hoping to get out of this a little bit, but they didn't. They, I mean, like, and the, and the way that they did it was okay. It's just like I just felt like it was just very, very bland, very bland in Cliff Notes version of the story, but with just like the evil twist. I, I think with with both, you are right. They gave you more of the transition mm-hmm. with him and his shift to evil, um, but they gave you less of the after effect once he was evil. Yeah, this one. Uh, give you less of that transition but it gave you way more of now this is what he's doing now that Mm -hmm. he's evil so then that's the trade-off both movies uh made in that aspect and when it comes off when you were talking about how the ship was programming programming him which i thought was really cool scene because it was kind of similar to the richard donner superman and smallville yeah and smallville and how the ship that's in their barn is calling to him at night you know <clears throat> but this one was he was in a hypnotic trance and he was going to it like he was sleepwalking but then it was sending him messages it was in in whatever language from his home planet and you could see him trying to interpret it in his head and so that's where i thought it was interesting because the voice kind of sounded evil a little bit but you know that it's it's something from another planet that might sound evil no matter what. And the way that he was interpreting it, what did he say that it was interpreting to something? Uh, the take wo- the world. Take the world. But yeah, but he he did it probably so like first he was just repeating the phrase, mm-hmm. and then he interpreted the take part. Yeah, and it was take, and then the other language. Yeah. for a little while. Yeah, then it was take the for a little while. So it's like he was breaking it down in fragments. Yeah, and then that was his ultimate. Uh, interpretation. Do you think it's possible that that is not what it was saying to him? I think it's highly possible that that wasn't it. I think it would be cool if it was save the world and like they were sending him yeah. there with good intentions and that's how it ended up. Um, yeah, but just right off the bat, there was just like something evil about him that didn't, that didn't trust right away. And, and you can you can see uh, hints of why his attitude uh, was like that by the end of it. Uh, they could have delved more into it, but you see him uh, getting bullied. Yeah, uh, by by the other kids, uh, basically just for being smart. But then you also see his interest. He has interest in in 
insects and wasps and how mm-hmm. certain uh, wasps hold a hierarchy over others. Mm-hmm. You have basically your ruler wasp and then your your worker like wasp. So those two aspects together, him getting bullied by beings that he finds out are lesser than him, less powerful, mm-hmm. when he's just like, why am I letting them do this to me? Yeah. Mixed with his knowledge of the way uh, predators and preys work, you can see that leading to him like, no, like I'm I'm a god yeah. amongst these people. Why should I be amongst everything should be my way? Yeah. That, I thought they did that stuff pretty good. I like I like seeing that. Like uh, w- once the story started moving a little bit, I was I was getting into it. Like once you see him get bullied and stuff and get the powers, that's when the movie started to pick up and actually be become pretty good. Um, and so he starts getting evil mm-hmm. and he starts he starts killing people. And uh, how did you feel that the horror element of that went? Because right off the bat, they try to make it seem scary. I I did. I I think it really kicked in in two scenes, and it was the. Um, the capturing, because we find out it wasn't a killing uh, right away, but the capturing of the mother of the girl that he likes, mm-hmm. that whole scene where he the fogs diner. up the windows and he's flying. And she get, and she gets the uh, glass in her eye. Yeah, and then yeah. it has that Ugh. cool visual where uh, she can see him through the blood. Of her so eyes, he's like yeah. standing in the red yeah. like that whole time. That was creepy. Uh, so that, that was really good, her hiding. So that, that it really got into the horror tension mm-hmm. in that aspect. And then the other one was the scene with the, with the uncle. Or oh, even before that with the aunt. Yeah. Which is like uh, motion sensors. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. See him going off. So I, at that point, when he went after the girl's mother, that's when it started turning into horror, in my opinion. Yeah. I, yeah, I could agree. I, oh, well, yeah, those scenes, those horror scenes. Yes, that's what but I said. felt like the, the vibe right from the beginning was horror. Like they were trying to like have a, a creepy vibe since the beginning. But you're right. As soon as he started going bad, like those horror scenes, that's when it really started kicking into horror. <clears throat> I, enjoy, I enjoyed uh, a, a lot of that stuff. And uh, especially with the uncle in the car and the yeah. truck, uh, when when the truck went like what? what exa- I just remember him being in front of the truck and he turns the lights on. And he well, was flying. The uncle's driver because uh, he catches the kid in his closet. He was like, "What the fuck are you doing?" <laughs> Natural <laughs> yeah. reaction. Yeah, he was like, what the <laughs> fuck are you doing in my closet with this <laughs> freaking creepy ass thing on? Yeah. So he's gonna take him home, and the kid's like, "No, you can't tell them. You can't tell my parents." And he pushes him into the barn. And then when the uncle turns around, he's gone. So he's like, he's about to speed to the yeah, house. Yeah, that's right. And then uh, this is where you see him fly into the car, uh, incapacitating the car. And then while he's trying to turn it back on, the lights turn on. And there he is just standing on the road. Yeah. And he's like, oh, shit, what the fuck? And then he does it again. Now he's floating on the road. And he's like, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> and then he, oh, man, he hit that car really hard. And, and re- do you remember his jaw hanging off? Well, because he he lifted the, the car all yeah. the way up in the air. Yeah. Um, which someone pointed out, someone that I was talking about this, it, it's kind of a playoff of one of Superman's most famous covers is him holding the car up. Oh, yeah. the fr- Yeah, yeah. That's and right. He, here he is. One. He's lifting the car up, except he's dropping it on his front. And just his mouth hits the steering wheel and his jaws yeah. just hanging off man that was so fucking gross and gruesome it was oh. actually kind of cool especially you know for a superhero type of thing yeah that that's it definitely used its rated r uh <laughs> rating mm-hmm. on there and then you see brandon go up to him and just like calmly stare at him as he dies and then pull a little blood off and then does his call sign on yeah the but he, he jiggled his jaw too at one point <laughs> didn't he that was so gross uh but there you see the sadistic side where he just he's looking at the human like oh like you're just body parts That's yeah it. <laughs> Ugh. And, you know, the story starts to escalate from there. And then it got to one of my favorite parts. And this is when uh, the parents start to realize that he has powers and that he's kind of he's kind of evil. <laughs> and the dad takes him to go hunting. And, um, you know, he kind of had like a makeup with the son. He was just like, hey, everything's OK. You know, let's let's just go take a little hunting trip. <laughs> And he brings him out to the woods, and he has the kid checking something. And then, like, the father's behind him with the gun, and he's just, like, aiming it at his head. And, like, that whole scene was just like, okay, this is the first time I actually felt them 
go into a little bit of depth in the story that I said it was lacking earlier. That was that was just imagine having to go through that decision. I'm like, here's a kid I was raising, right? And everything was great. All of a sudden, he starts developing these evil superpowers, and he could just be the most awful thing that has ever hit the planet. And I could kill it right now. And it's just, man, that was powerful. That was crazy. And then just from uh, Brandon's perspective, if you, you look at it, when he killed uh, when he killed the uncle and when he was threatening the, the aunt is yeah. because uh, it was going to get back to his parents. Yeah. And then even even through the argument that they had in the house where he pushes his father against the wall, mm-hmm. you could say he still goes on this hunting trip with the father. He still feels that connection with his parents. Yeah. Even through this turn. Now he's pretty much evil because he's killed two people yeah. and threatened another person. But he still has the connection with the father. He still they're still his parents, yeah. which is why he trusts him. He doesn't think that his father's going to try to shoot him in the back of the head. Mm-hmm. And you see the look of a betrayal when the bullet bounces off his head. Yeah. So I like that aspect because it created a little conflict. Yeah. He didn't just make a switch and now like everything for the past 11, 12 years, whatever old he was, was gone. Mm-hmm. He still had some connection to humanity. Yeah. But that's right. Once that bullet went bouncing off his head, that was kind of like I'm d- I'm done with this shit. I feel like that was one of those where like it pauses and you hear it was at that moment <laughs> where he knew he fucked up. Yeah. That was the <laughs> that was the flash going in fast motion in Justice League and then seeing that Superman can see him in fast motion is like fuck. <laughs> But yeah, man, that was that was crazy because now uh, like the the sheriff is starting to get oh, involved. Okay. What what's that? The, the, freak, the laser face kill. Which oh, that's right. That's how he killed his dad with the laser eyes. Yeah, right through his head. I f- completely forgot. I thought that it just like left, and you heard him scream. I forgot that. Yeah, you got to. He did laser eyes right to his fucking yeah. face, man. W- which is it's again. It's also from a from a comic book moment from the Injustice comics, yeah. which deals with an evil Superman. That's how he kills Shazam because Shazam was speaking out against him. Mm-hmm. He blasts right through his face, and mm-hmm. they they brought it into this for his father that was crazy but what a way to go man that, that solidified him and he's all right he's he's really really bad guy and then we got we got another uh horror aspect of it at that point where you know the mom is calling he picks up the phone and he's like i'm already here yeah and he's floating outside the house <laughs> yeah that was fucking crazy because then because uh, the cops are looking for him too mm-hmm. um i think it's because they they noticed the the bright burn symbols the symbols bb yeah and uh it was also his suspicious behavior beforehand when he broke the because he had already a run-in with the cop when he broke the girl's hand yeah that's right uh in there so that and then the bb so it made made him a little suspicious and uh, he goes in to go confront mom, and the cops are there, and like he's taking them out. That whole scary scene is almost like when a house gets haunted, and the walls start shaking. You know, in those movies, like that when that poltergeist is there, or, like paranormal mm. activity, everything's shaking. But it's him just flying through the house, and the the mom is just hiding underneath the the table and shit, and just screaming at all that. That's fucking nuts. He fucking he explodes he goes so fast into the sheriff that he explodes oh, yeah. him <laughs> that's how, he's super splattered st- yeah just splattered him everywhere uh with the the deputy he's like in front of her mm-hmm. and all of a sudden he disappears and he's behind her yeah so we're getting even more of the horror here and i think my favorite part and it was a call back to the beginning when he was playing with his mom, hide and go seek is yeah. now he starts doing the whistling that he does with his mom when they play hide and seek, which is kind of like a rip off of the Conjuring with the clap claps. You know, you remember that in the first Conjuring mm-hmm. movie with the hide and seek aspect. But um, I just talking about that. I mean, with the super speed and how I feel like the superhero genre has such uh, a good thing going for it in horror because you can use superpowers and make them scary. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Just like, almost like how Jason appears in every doorway. You know, it's kind of like that that type of horror element to it that just fit right right with this movie. I and mean, when you see, uh, there's plenty of horror movies with like evil kids and things like that, but a lot of times you get the de- demonic aspect of it. Yeah. And stuff. You can't exercise... Uh, Superpowers. You can't exercise Brandon <laughs> unless like, you got some other fucking kryptonite. Uh, yeah, but we we don't know if kryptonite exists here. Yeah, no way. We know his other weakness, but 
Um, so we see, so he's chasing the mom. She goes out to the barn and she realizes that she can use that because that ship can hurt him. Mm-hmm. And so she finds like a piece of paneling that she rips off the ship. First of all, how does she rip off this crazy? It can hurt the, the metal can hurt him, but she can just rip it off so easy. I mean, I think she took, uh, she took the piece out of the part that Crashed. was the impact point. Yeah. The impact, so yeah. yeah, the part there was a little flimsy, which is the part that cut him initially earlier yeah. in the movie. Just happened to be in the exact same shape and size of a knife. <laughs> <laughs> and so she's talking to him. She's trying to calm him down, and she's hu- hugging him. And then he's like, she's about to, to stab him with that with that shard from the ship. And he just, like, grabs it and stops her. And he just flies high up in the sky. And, like, but through the roof of the barn, they explode through that. And I like that because when you get to the above the clouds and he's with her, you can see her all, like, bloody and stuff from going through the roof, which I never really, you never really see that in, like, the Superman stuff whenever he mm-hmm. grabs somebody and bursts through the wall. They're always unscathed and they're okay. Oh. But this one, she's, like, she's all fucked up. And it was just a, a, a little shitty wooden roof from a barn. You know, I yeah. thought that was cool. And then he just drops her. Yeah. And, and what I like about this scene is, again, you see that she is able to tap into whatever of humanity he still has left. And he stops what he's doing. Like, he just killed the other two people. He killed the father. He killed the dep- deputy. He killed the sheriff. But then, like, he stops again for her. Yeah. And he's like, I want to, I want to do good. And all that, so she's able to talk him down. But again, he finds himself betrayed in his eyes, even though like he just killed a fucking lot of people. But in his eyes, is his father betrayed him? That was someone he actually loved. Yeah, because he didn't give a shit about his uncle. And then now his mom, who he loves even more, now she's trying to kill him. And I think that was like the last bit of humanity he had left. Well, see, that that's where I, I keep going back to. They were just really shitty parents because I, I want to be good, Mom. Okay, you'd be able to talk that kid down. You'd be able to be like, hey, let's walk through this these powers together and, and just instill goodness in them when you see something like that and not just try to kill it. But, although I like that aspect. But, but I mean, he just did murder like five people, including, yeah, including his father. I know, <laughs> I know. But I'm just saying just like if he's like, Mom, I, I want to be good. I want There'd be a way to get through to that kid. And that's why I just felt like they were just shitty parents. But if they were good parents, it wouldn't have been the movie. It wouldn't have been the yeah. movie that we, we wouldn't have gotten evil Superman. I think I would have tried to kill them again. <laughs> I'd be like, <laughs> next tantrum you throw? <laughs> like, you want to be good, but can you be good? Yeah, like, that's you, right. You already murdered like five people. <laughs> <laughs> so, you got to catch him before the first murder. Exactly. Like pre, pre-murder. pre Maybe one murder by accident. Even like <laughs> the one time he tried to be encouraging to his son, he basically gave him the advice to go stalk this girl. <laughs> like yeah. He just shows up in front of her window. He's just hovering above her window, kept on opening up her computer while she was sleeping, and it was making her wake up, and he's standing outside the window. He, he was giving her the, the Cusack. <laughs> <laughs> just with her laptop. But it, he misinterpreted that advice, which again goes to the fact that maybe he misinterpreted what was coming out of the ship. Yeah, that's right. I, that's what I think. And I think that would be far more interesting. But this movie just leaves me asking more questions about that world. But what was good is, and you see his intelligence in there where he's able to get away with it because what's the best way for him to make it justifiable of the people that he just killed yeah in there is he takes a plane and he forces it to crash on the farm yeah so then now it, it looks, covers that it covers up the plane killed all those people yeah. he happened to survive in there and we see him eating a cookie and he fucking wrote bb on the fucking plane wreckage talk about screwing up your fucking get out of jail free card well that's the thing they don't know what are they gonna think uh, that they don't no one knows that he's an alien. At least no one. No, that's but they'll be able alive. to put those pieces together because the f- the all the evidence in the police department of the BB being painted everywhere. He painted it on the wreckage. Well, so eventually somebody will find that. But are they gonna pin a airplane falling down on a kid? No, but to make, everyone, he's just a normal kid. They'll make connection. They happen to land on his farm, but then there's other people connected to him too. They'd make a they'd make a connection. But what like that ship? Uh, we, we talked about this when we saw the movie. We haven't talked about it yet. It's like how we weren't really digging the design of the ship that much. No. 
it looked it looked like it was developed in the eighties <laughs> <laughs> and never really evolved past that. Maybe it was just in space for a long time. It's outdated. <laughs> yes, yeah, so it needs to get that upgrade. Uh, okay, yeah. So that's basically how that's the movie. That's, yeah, that's that's all it was during the post credits. The like during the credits rolling, you start to see hints of what his future is like. You see news reports of stuff. Yeah, you see like uh, buildings collapsing and him coming out of it, and he's just known as this figure. Yeah, uh, this in the distance. Speaking and you of which, see- uh, I'm sorry, sorry to cut you off. That, that when we're talking about that figure, he was wearing his baby blanket that he was found in the ship. That was such a weird design for a mask as a figure, like because it, I, I, it, it almost looked like it had shoelaces but in that face. It, it makes sense because of his obsession with insects. It was very insect. Okay, so it, it it makes sense that he made it look that way. But it's like I don't know. It's just a weird. Like I really want to get another good look at that mask and see what it was originally designed. Because like, was it in the shape of like a sack when he was a baby, and then he just added those strings to it, or what? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I know you see in the book that he designed it himself, so it didn't come like that. Okay. He created it. But it was his baby blanket. I think yeah, they took the blanket and I think he added to it. Because that's. Uh, obviously the same thing as superman's cape because superman's cape was actually supposed to be the baby blanket for that he was wrapped in and that's mm-hmm. what became superman's cape a lot, I, I don't think a lot of people know that except for the comic yeah. fans yeah so here yeah he used that he just expanded on it and you know he had a mask superman never had a mask this right. version had a mask so he had to cover his face and you notice like when he was going to do the killing he would put on the mask so it separated him yeah. from from Brandon. He was whatever it is, BB or whatever he calls himself. We don't know what he's going to call himself. What's up, BB? <laughs> Hi, girl. <laughs> uh, and and uh, tidbit in the, in the credits is we see uh, Michael Rooker come out. Michael Rooker? Yeah. He comes out. He comes out on the credit. He's like this, like web series, like this YouTube conspiracy oh, okay. theorist, <laughs> yeah. and stuff talking about like people need to wake up, like this is happening. Yeah. He's the one showing that that voice, and he talks about uh, two other people. He's talking about some half man, half sea creature who's been sinking ships, uh-huh. and a woman who's been. Uh, you know, hanging people with her rope, <laughs> like this powerful woman, which is, you know, Wonder Woman. evil Wonder Woman, evil Aquaman. So there, it expands the universe a little bit. <laughs> they couldn't put an evil Batman because Batman's already like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what if it was a good Batman? <laughs> Maybe he ends up being the hero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. All right, man. So uh, any other thoughts on, on Brightburn? Do you think that they're going to continue on, make a sequel? Because uh, how much money is it making? I think, I mean... So far, it's made seventeen million. It only costs six million. Oh, okay. In the budget, so it's definitely going to make his money back. Yeah. And I know uh, Sony had said that over the next few years they plan on really expanding their horror. Okay. Uh, a repertoire. They're going to uh, bring back some some older classics. They're they're rushing the Escape Room one, which was. Not a good movie, but it made some money, so yeah. they're, they're rushing that for next year. So. I didn't even see that one. <laughs> but I think uh, the fact that it was low budget, they kept it open for a sequel, it's going to make us money back, and Sony wanting to you know, release more horror going forward, I think that all points to signs that we might get something. But it probably won't be maybe like 21, 22, because... If they want Gunn revolved on it, he's going to be busy for a couple of years. Yeah. Well, I mean, executive producing isn't the same as directing another movie, but you're you are pretty much you're heavily involved in that aspect. But but you you, you can tell that he put a lot of his fingerprint on this. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think they would do for a sequel? Do you think they would focus on those other characters? Do you think they'd do like a Batman v Superman where there's like it's one movie with all of them slowly introducing their universe or what? Uh, yeah, they could do that. Maybe they have them jo- join up, <laughs> create like an evil Justice League to stand up against a hero. <laughs> yeah, that'd be kind of crazy. <laughs> Something like that. Uh, I mean, there's so much that could go. Maybe in the next one, they focus on someone else. We don't even see him. You know what would be kind of cool? Not not focusing on this one, but somewhere in that world, if there was the opposite of him, like what if there was like a good, like maybe whatever planet sent him, sent two of them, and one of them just ended up being good, and the other one ended up being bad. That'd be a fun fucking movie. That. That'd be fucking yeah. crazy to see. Just so they open it up where you can go anywhere, since it's 
even though it copies a lot of the elements, it's original content, so they can do whatever they want. Mm-hmm. They're not restricted by anything. Yeah, that's right. That's true. They, they don't have to worry about other franchises as long as they're not fucking copying yeah. exact elements. Or people yelling like, you didn't do it like the comic. Yeah. It's, it's its own thing. <laughs> yeah, it's its own thing. That's right. That's true. That's where I kind of like, I'm okay with seeing things like that. You know, I'm like, hey, you fucking do whatever you want. It's not real anyway. And I do, I do hope they make a sequel, even though I wasn't in love with this movie, because why the fuck not? I'd go see any movie. I do, and I don't. Uh, I do because I want to see more, mm-hmm. and I don't because... It worked well as its own movie. And I feel if you try to do too much with it, it can really go wrong. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that brings me to my final thoughts of this this movie. Like I gave it, my rating was 7, 7.5. Okay. And like I explained earlier, I think what stopped it from being a really good movie is that they played it safe. Yeah. They, they gave a very simple concept. They got right into it, gave us exactly what they said they were going to give us, but they didn't take a lot of chances uh, with it. And that stopped it from being a horrible movie if it would have gone wrong, but mm-hmm. it also stopped it from being a great movie because it didn't give us enough there. All right. Uh, for my rating, I give it a, I'm at, I'm at a six. I felt like, I mean, overall, just seeing it shot for shot looked okay. But narratively, I just felt like it never really evolved past what the concept was. It's just an evil version of Superman. Um, I thought the horror elements were good. Um, I d- even though I was ragging on the family stuff, I still like the performances of Elizabeth Bank and uh, what's his name, David Denman. I- I've I've liked that guy for a long time. Mm-hmm. He's been in a lot of stuff that I like. He he always plays a great character. Uh, overall, I mean, it's watchable. It- it's it's a it's an okay movie. Just for me, I don't know. It just didn't rate that high. But I don't think it was bad. I just I just didn't love it. So yeah, th- that's our thoughts on Brightburn. And we hope that, you know, even though I didn't like it that much, I hope there are more sequels and I'll watch the shit out of those. I just, you know, just hope they keep on making more horror superhero stuff because that was kind of cool. That was kind of cool to see. I'd like to see them take on other types of characters and see how they could do those. Just so overall for horror, I want to see more of this where it's just different types of horror movies in general, regardless who's putting it out. Absolutely. Because it was good to see a non uh, demonic or slasher horror movie (laughs) okay all right guys well it's time to start wrapping things up and like we do at the end of every single one of our terror phobia episodes we're going to leave you guys with a two sentence horror story just to keep the horror vibe going jose why don't you take us away all right once again he stands heroic and victorious as he punched the city's tormentor through our building defeating him once and for all I get one last glimpse of our savior flying away with him before our building collapses on us. Oh, damn. Oh, that's a good one, man. Yeah, that kind of reminded me of Batman v Superman. That, that's what I, I had in mind. Oh, man, that was cool. All right, this one, I uh, actually, I read off the internet the other day. I just I was scrolling through and I saw this one and I thought it was okay. I was walking home one night and decided to cut past the cemetery. As I was approaching the cemetery, there were a couple of girls who stopped me and asked if they could walk with me because they were scared. And as we're, I said, sure. And as we're walking, I said, it's okay. I used to get scared too walking by here when I was alive. I've never seen them run so fast. <laughs> I like that. I like that's like that. it. It's kind of it's classic. It's classic. It's classic. I like the ones where it ends up he was dead the whole yeah. time. <laughs> Had a sixth sense that stuff. All right, guys. Well, thanks for checking us out here on Terraphobia, right on the Too High McFly podcast channel. If you guys are listening to us on SoundCloud or Spotify, why don't you guys travel over to our YouTube channel at Too High McFly Productions? You can see our short films, our other movie reviews, and a whole bunch of other content we have out there for you. Why don't you guys also uh, reach out to us on Twitter at Too High McFly? productions let us know what you guys thought of bright burn and uh what horror movies you guys are excited for for the rest of the year until next time my name is kevin Lyons. i'm jose ramos stay scary guys